So we've got a nice four box here. We're going to have a fun Zoom interview with Rick Neuheisel. And I'll start with the resume, which is impressive, Rick, with just as a player, the 84 Rose Bowl MVP, coached Washington, Colorado, UCLA. He's now a top-notch college football analyst, CBS Sports College Football Today, Sirius XM Radio with the full ride, uh, all, all kinds of good stuff. And look, we call our interviews, Rick, impact interviews. So I'm going to ask you about the impact of the Pac-12 having five teams in the top 25, and just how much better is college football when the Pac-12 is strong and really relevant on the scene? Well, first, let me say thank you for uh, having me. It's great to be with this illustrious uh, group. <laughs> As I look around seeing Jay and TB, that is big time company, Todd. Uh, and as you went through my resume, it just means I can't keep a job. Uh, but I'm thrilled that the Pac-12 is back in the conversation uh, with respect to college football. You know, it almost always seems, especially since the advent of the college football playoff, where we know one conference, at least one conference, is going to be left out uh, as we get to the final uh, four. We've seen a couple of years where it's been two conferences that have been left out as Notre Dame has uh, joined the fray uh, in a couple of those seasons. But at the end of the day, we have these ebbs and flows for, for conferences as how they're determined by the college football public as to who's, who's the weak link. And for too long, it's been the Pac-12. And that win by UCLA, uh, where Tom and I both toiled at times, uh, over LSU this last week, uh, was a dominant, dominant victory. Maybe the most physical victory we've seen by a Pac-12 team over a name brand in the last decade. And it serves notice that that kind of football can be played on the West Coast. I mean, if you look historically, the West Coast has been a big factor in college football, and it's nice to see them getting their due. Big weekend this weekend, you know, with Oregon at Ohio State, Washington coming off a loss to Montana. The Husky fans are pulling their hair out, but they can get back on the right track immediately with the win in the big house over Michigan. Uh, those two games, and then Colorado's got Texas A&M. Those three chances uh, can even further move the agenda for the new commissioner, George Klyovkov. Well, Rick, I'm going to jump in. Uh, I'm going to pull a little uh, inside information. By the way, you that. look fantastic in that in that vintage Penn State. It uh, is vintage. Yeah, it that is, is older I mean, than if, all of my kids. Do you have black uh, spot-built cleats on, too? No, no, not spot built. But <laughs> every pair of Nikes, almost every pair of Nikes I own are black. As your dad used to call them, slippers. The Nike yes. slippers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of that, uh, a few years ago, Phil Knight told a story on national television uh, at my dad's uh, memorial service. And he talked about on a Nike trip that someone used to bring his guitar. Guilty. And that the last night was talent night. And he said uh, there was a duet annually with Rick Neuheisel and one Joseph Vincent Paterno. <laughs> um, uh, tell us a little bit about the complete lack of singing talent and how that, how'd you get him up on stage? I literally told this story yesterday on the radio program. I, I literally told this story because it's Pitt is playing at Tennessee this weekend. Yep. And they're calling it the Johnny Majors honorary game because Johnny, of course, coached both of those programs. And Johnny, I used to get up and sing, and Johnny's song was Marisy Dotes and Dozy Dotes and Little Lambs Eat Ivy. A kid'll eat Ivy too, wouldn't you? And Johnny would sing that full-throated and, and get the crowd going. And, and I said, it remind me of a duo, a duet I used to have with the great Joe Vincent Paterno where he'd get up and do wild things. I, I go, Joe, all you have to do is when I nod at you, you just say, wild thing. Okay? <laughs> and we go, da-na, da da And Joe's like kind of snapping his fingers. Like right. Frank Sinatra. And, and then he would always, and, and you're going to love this, Jay, because he would always tell the story about being in seventh grade at whatever little Catholic school he went to where the sister told him, Joe, you don't sing in the choir. Your voice is changing. Unfortunately, she said that in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th, yes. 11th, and 12th. But he would get there, and we'd hit the note, and I'd nod, and he'd wait a couple extra beats and go, wow, thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was so vintage. 
And everybody there laughed their tails off. And obviously, when your dad passed, we all thought back of those moments and how much we miss him. And uh, Jay, just for everybody that's out there to, to know, your dad was a prince to me, absolute prince to me, and I miss him every day. Well, I tell you, my mom's 60th birthday party was one of my first years back at Penn State. And uh, I got up with the band and sang <laughs> Symphony for the Devil. And my dad was behind me doing the woo hoo. <laughs> he was perfect and, uh, for the woo hoo. Yeah, the whole family was behind me doing the woo hoo, except my mom. My mom, being a very devout Catholic, wanted nothing to do with a song called Symphony for the Devil. <laughs> oh, man. I miss your mom's cookies, too. Oh, get up here for a game, and I'll get. You tell I Sue you, I'm I, I'm I'm missing those cookies. Now you you were up here for the 2006, I think, Ohio State game uh, when you were Baltimore. You brought the kids up. Exactly right. It was right. a whiteout. Talk, talk about what you think about the whiteout because we got one for Auburn next week. So I have three boys, Jerry, Jack, and Joe, and we all drove uh, from Baltimore to. Uh, uh, the beautiful campus there in, in uh, Happy Valley. And Joe had us all set up and took the tour of the campus. You gave us a tour of the facility. Uh, we got over there for when the bus cruises up to the stadium and the quarterback's the first guy off, Jerry. And there, I, I don't know how many thousand people there were there, but it was, it was packed just to watch the quarterback get off the school bus. And, and I'm just telling you, my son, who ended up being a quarterback at UCLA said, if I can go to Penn State, that I'm going. I'm going to Penn State. This is where I want to go. <laughs> and just the whole atmosphere, and then to go out, and I think it's a Bon Jovi song that they were singing, the, 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 the student section. Oh, yeah, the yeah, Living on a Prayer. Living on a Prayer. And my three boys' eyes were as big as saucers, and they were like, we're coming to Penn State. It was the <laughs> coolest atmosphere. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out great for the Lions that night. Ohio State had a pretty good team. But all the alums on the sideline, all the great names from Penn State uh, teams of, of yesteryear and all kind of coming up and saying hello to your dad. Your dad gave the, I mean, gave the boys the greatest. He goes, come on, guys, let me show you around. It was like they're getting a tour from, from the great uh, almighty himself. I mean, Joe Paterno was giving these three towheads a tour of the dang uh, stadium. It was, it was off the charts. I go, Joe, you have other things to be doing right now, but, but it was a phenomenal experience and uh, uh, ones that my kids will never forget and still cherish. Scrap, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just listening. He's bringing back a lot of great memories here. So I, how comes everybody else got to sing with Joe? I, I got a little different tone when I was with him. Okay? You guys all got singing and happy kumbaya stuff. You know, I didn't, there was some, I the first didn't get a lot time, of guitar playing in the my first, office. The first time I ever saw him, I was, it was a, another Nike trip. And we, it was in, uh, it was in uh, the Bahamas. And I remember walking in and you were walking by the pool to get to our rooms. And over there holding court was the great Joe Paterno. And I'm whispering to my wife, I'm but uh, 33, 34 years old at the time. I go, there's Joe Paterno. And all of a sudden he looks over and gets, gets, sees me and he goes, New Heisel, New Heisel, get over here. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, he knows me. And now I, go, I, I, put, I put the bags down. I, I go walking, I go, honey, I'll be right back. I go walking and he goes, what the hell are you doing? Taking your kids skiing. You're taking your kids skiing. How the hell are we supposed to keep up with that? You know, talking about because I had taken the whole team skiing uh, because there was a ski mountain within 20 miles of campus, and I arranged it couldn't be an extra benefit, so I arranged for the ski mountain to make it free for the entire student body from that one afternoon, a half-day pass, and they'd get all kinds of publicity, and we took our whole football team up there skiing. It was Jay, you should have seen us trying to get him in ski boots. <laughs> I'm jealous. There was, it, there was some feet that just didn't fit in ski boots. We had to create mini toboggans for them. But uh, it, 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 was a, it was an unbelievable day. So Joe's hitting me, and then he just gets this big smile on his face. He goes, I'm just kidding, kid. You're good for the game. Now get yourself a bourbon. <laughs> Uncle, get yourself a bourbon. Uncle Phil's paying. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Phil. Uncle hey, Phil's I, paying. And, and I'm telling you, I, I, I'm like, I walked back to my wife. I said, 
that was the coolest thing that ever happened to me. That was Joe Paterno <laughs> spending time with Rick Neuheisel. What the heck's going on around here? Hey, uh, shifting gears, because Penn State's got Ball State tomorrow. And you did their bowl a game. A dangerous and team. A dangerous yes, team. Yes. We, we've been warning people. I've been warning everyone. Hey, don't take they, – they got, they got a wide out that is as good as anybody nobody's ever heard of. And that quarterback's pretty good. Talk about what you saw with them against San Jose State. Well, they played an undermanned San Jose State in the uh, Arizona Bowl. And that's not to take away from uh, Mike News, you know, the first ever bowl win in Ball State history, by the way. They'd never yeah. won a bowl game prior to that. But Drew Plitt, their quarterback, is, you know, one of those advanced guys. They're going to have a bunch of super seniors, guys that have come back and want to play again because it was that much fun to play for uh, Ball State last year. They've got uh, a nice-looking secondary. They've got a nice-looking uh, group of skill on the offensive side. They are – they're an efficient football team. And we don't know if Penn State's slow out of the blocks offensively. We give a lot of credit to Wisconsin – off uh defensively uh but that was a great win and you guys uh both know all of you know what confidence does for a football team and when you go on the road and beat wisconsin after that jump around and make the plays that they made that made down the stretch penn state's obviously feeling really good about himself but hopefully not so good about themselves that they're looking forward to that auburn game a week from now because ball state deserves their full attention Rick, you mentioned the offense. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Coach Yurcich and the pace of the offense. Whether they were successful or not, everything happens quickly. I mean, they went 86 yards in 55 seconds, and then they would do three plays and out pretty quickly. The pressure that kind of puts on the defense on both sides, you know, not just your opponent, but maybe your own team from a standpoint of getting ready to come right back out. From a head coach's perspective, because you can bring a perspective to this as a quarterback, head coach, the whole thing, you know, your thoughts on moving that rapidly the entire game, that kind of pace, what does that do to a, a team, the advantages, and maybe does it lead to any disadvantages? Most coaches that believe in the up-tempo style of play believe it has to be indoctrinated into your program. It has to be just a religion. Uh, I'm not one of those. I believe that there's a time, just like a boxer, a time to go with a flurry and go as fast as you can. And if you got them on the ropes, you keep flurrying. Uh, but there's also a time to pull back and save the other side of the ball. Most of these offensive coaches that believe in tempo, 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 really aren't listening to a lot what's going on on that defensive side. Because that puts your defense in the street if they've just been out there on a long drive and have to be out there after three and out. It hey, Rick, it's a lonely street sometimes It's out a there. lonely it's street. As it's, it's Tom's it's sitting there smiling, he knows it's all lonely, about this. It's lonely at you, times out there. You weren't but, invited to that staff meeting, were you, Tom? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't get that memo what time to be there, okay? You know, no. uh, and, and, I think, and, Rick, as you, look, as you look at Ohio State, I think one of the things that's evolved with them is they've gone to that up-tempo so much that they've suffered defensively the last couple of years. They haven't been as good. And you look against Minnesota, you know, they, you know, as you look at the Oregon game this weekend, you know, Minnesota, Minnesota had 200 yards rushing and 200 yards passing on them, and Ohio State looked like they were on the ropes a little bit, sometimes no defensively. And, and 38 minutes of possession time. That you're out there for 38 minutes uh, as a defense, especially, uh, you know, as you're trying to develop depth, you're, you're in harm's way. So there's got to be a happy medium. We all understand the advantages of running up-tempo. I mean, Wisconsin, I think, had 95 plays the other day because they were getting the ball back so quickly, right? And uh, it was a yeoman effort by Penn State to keep them to 10 points given that many plays. But if you do that every week, you're going to suffer consequences. And that's what – there's got to be a fine balance, and I'm sure James is, is thinking that over and mulling it over as he uh, develops a plan. Your game plan has to be involving both sides of the ball. So often we talk game plans – as to just this is our defensive game plan, this is our offensive game plan. There has to be a melding of thought so that you're understanding the flow of the game, and that's the head coach's uh, job. Hey, Rick, you know what's interesting? So Wisconsin last year led the country in time of possession, I think 36-45. They were 105th in scoring. So that would be, to me, 
would be very interesting because that would be a great place to coach defense because you know, <laughs> hey our stats are hey, Tom, way to go Tom, off and you're over, there, time you're time over there having a Gatorade and they're just you know <laughs> hey we've only been on the field here for 18 minutes our stats look pretty good we're pretty good on defense I'll, hey Tom, for those I'm of you at home let it let the world know that Tom is a defensive guy <laughs> well, I'm gonna call time out because Tom coached at a school for a very long time where defense came first. And there were a lot of really, really good football players that we as offensive coaches going, boy, he'd be a great running back. Wow, he'd be a great wideout. And Joe's like, no, nope, no, nope, the best 11 are going on defense first. So, Tom, no, I don't want to – and hey, Tom why is also – Hey, why do you think, fast, damn it. Why do you think some of those times I would give your dad a ride home? We have to – I know. Because <laughs> you don't need to walk home today. I'll give you a ride. The weather looks bad. The first person the first person to recruit at Penn State was Joe. He had to recruit Joe to your way of thinking yes. as to how to get yes. those guys on your side of the ball. No question. But, but you know, Rick, the thing you mentioned, it, and I, I've said it a bunch of times, is so many coaches and head coaches in the game now, they're recruiters. And they have an offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and they, if the offensive coordinator doesn't do certain things, they fire them. And it's almost like, like you said, they're not communicating, they're not talking. You know, I can tell you, there were games where Joe would come in to us, you know, we'd be at Ohio State in 05, and Joe said, look, if the punter or the kicker is on the field at the end of every offensive possession, we'll win the game because we're that good on defense. Don't take too many chances. And we won the game 17-10. And then there were other times we said, you know, this other team's really good offensively. We're going to we're gonna have to put some points up. So, I mean, you know, do you see that in the game? I mean, do you see Bill McCartney, Bill McCartney Pardon? years ago told me while I was coaching with him at Colorado, said the first job, he pulled me over during a game. He said, you're going to be a head coach someday. So you remember this. The first job of a head coach is not to lose the game before you win the game. Don't lose the game by doing things that are outside what you do or not paying attention to what you just mentioned which is the, the marriage between offense and defense. The game is a field position game. The game is a, how do we keep them on their end of the field? How do we keep the attack on that side of the field? The, the numbers speak for themselves uh, as we become so into analytics. Uh, so those that say if you end every drive with a kick uh, are, are right. If you don't turn the ball over, you're in good shape. Look at that Indiana-Iowa game last week. We come away thinking that Iowa was dominant and, and, and just blew uh, Indiana out, and the score would dictate that, 34-6. to six. But if you really study it, it was Michael Penix throwing two pick sixes that changed the entire course of the game, and now you get out of your rhythm. You can't run the ball because now you're playing catch-up, and uh, you put yourself behind the eight ball. Penix was 14-31. to 31. But on the other side, Petrus was only 13-27. to 27. Indiana's defense – would have been fine, but for the fact that they ended up turning the ball over and costing their, their, uh, the team two touchdowns. And you fall behind like that, it changes the whole course of action. And that's why you have to, while you love up tempo and you love flamboyant offense, you've got to be mindful of the game and defensively and field position uh, all the while. You know, Rick, I used to get the lecture about patience all the time. He would always say, hey, it takes three field goals to beat a touchdown. And if they would put a big drive together, you know, a 12 to 15 play drive, he'd say, let's see if they can do it again without, you know, a penalty, a turnover and things of that nature. Exactly. And so, you know, if, if you just sit in there and sometimes I think people get too anxious at times and do some things rather than just be patient and let it play out. And that's what I like about Penn State as compared to Wisconsin. As a matter of fact, even though Penn State was the underdog on the road, I picked them to win the game because I think that uh, Dotson kid, uh, the Washington kid, they came back with 88 catches. I don't think Wisconsin has a receiver that can make that big play on a consistent basis. So I, I think that Penn State and Sean Clifford, as long as he plays within himself, they have plenty of big play capability. As they'll keep pounding and, and working on that running game, I think Sean Clifford can be terrific to go along with what looked like a terrific start to their defensive uh, season. Well, you mentioned Clifford and offenses. He's, he's seeing a new offense. I mean, he's a veteran quarterback, but he's had to switch a couple of years in a row right. as to his style. And it's interesting because, you know, they talk about, we, you know, all of us talked a little bit of golf. You talk about a veteran golfer that's missed some putts, right? And does that stick in their head? Or do you have a young guy that's not, that doesn't have that memory, isn't fresh? When you have a quarterback that's had a good year and then a not-so-good year, Rick, 
how, how is that about building his confidence and maintaining his positive mindset to make sure he's remembering? Because, you know, you get in the heat of the game and you don't know how a person's going to react, whether they're going to remember the times they didn't come through, or they're always going to remember the times that they do come through. That quarterback confidence issue is so imperative in these young guys. Because, look, we're talking about 18 to 23-year-old kids, right? Have you, have you guys been watching Will uh, Ted Lasso? <laughs> no, you, have, have you, everybody okay. tells me I gotta watch it. You gotta watch Ted Lasso in in, in the uh, in the show. He talks about the, uh, the 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 organism or the animal on planet that has the shortest memory is a goldfish. It's ten seconds. The goldfish has a ten second memory. Quarterbacks need to have be goldfish when things go wrong. Uh, doesn't mean they don't remember it, so they don't make that mistake again. But their confidence can never be destroyed. And, and coaches get a feel for their confidence by looking them in the eye. A quarterback will come off the sideline, and you can look him in the eye, and you can know that he knows he made that mistake, he knows what the mistake was, and he'll be gosh darned if he's going to do that again. Don't worry, coach. You can also see that guy that is completely bamboozled, that has no idea what just happened, and now is like, oh, my gosh, it's my fault again. And that is worry. that's a worry. You have to have goldfish memory, and you have to have, you know, the, uh, the guts of a burglar when you're, uh, when you're playing that position. And that's, that's just, you know, what's inside you, and that's what we're all out there trying to recruit. Okay, Rick, two last things to hit you with before we go. Number one, if you were in college in the NIL age, what would be your dream endorsement company? <laughs> Who would you most like to partner with? Uh, I don't two, know. There's two questions to end this thing. Goodness gracious. Uh, what, what a great opportunity for all these kids. Uh, hopefully they're taking full advantage of it. I thought about that just the other day when Graham Mertz was struggling down the stretch and threw the two interceptions late. I said, does that give Wisconsin fans now a, a right to boo the heck out of him and be upset at him more so than maybe in the past where they just feel bad because he's a college kid that had a rough afternoon uh, because now you're taking money. You're in some ways a professional. Uh, that was my first thought. But if I'm looking for an endorsement, uh, I, I would be all about uh, something. Uh, now, this was back when I had hair. It would have to have been something with the, with the hair product, you know, when I had long blonde hair. Now that I'm losing my hair, I'm, I'm, I'm going straight – I'm going straight to some hair restoration product that uh, maybe gives me hope to rekindle what uh, these soldiers that I'm losing over and over. Well, you know, you mentioned NL. I was watching the Georgia Clemson game, and every Fansville commercial had the Clemson's quarterback on him going, ooh, this is, Did you notice, this is a though, bad juxtaposition right now. Did you notice that in that commercial, he's not allowed to wear the Clemson yeah. uh, jersey? That's a yeah. state law in South Carolina. And they are actually going to have that law repealed by January 1. I talked to the Clemson coaches about it because Alabama is able to partner with their players and actually yep. have the, their, their brand associated with their student athletes. So they're going to have that done by January 1. That's the power of college football because they cannot fall behind the other states that allow for that. So uh, look for well, that know, change uh, quickly in, in uh, South Carolina. Yeah, being on the board of trustees at Penn State, we are having ongoing discussions about NIL and that kind of stuff. Okay, last question, because I know you're a music guy, and I know you're of the same kind of vintage that the rest of us are, which means, old. you know, you just mean old. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. Stones or Beatles? I'm a Beatles guy, but as I get oh. older, as I get older and older, and I know you you tip me off with your sympathy of the, with the for the devil uh, deal. As I get older and older, and I actually saw the Stones probably within the last five or six years, I they're growing on me. But my formative years, I was uh, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Okay. And now that's, have it, Todd. that's not a fair question because the stones have lasted forever. I mean, have you know, they who, who knew Watts, they would last so long? Unbelievable. Keith Charlie Richards Watts, defies whatever, whatever it's about. Keith Richards defies it on a daily basis. I love it. Well, and at you, the end of the day, I envision that if the nuclear holocaust ever occurs, my mom and Keith Richards will emerge as the last two humans on the planet, along with the cockroaches. They'll, they'll survive it. 
Well, we just hope that some video of, of Joe singing Wild Thing emerges somehow, some way. Oh, that I is, wish we that, had it. I wish is, we had it. That is just phenomenal. And Tariq Castro Fields was asked the NIL question, and he went right away to Chick fil A nuggets. So we know the mindset of the college student is usually food. That's, that's I went right what to what I need too, that's which right. is hair. That's right. That's right. Well, look, Rick Neuheisel, you know, thanks so much for joining us. You get a feel for what I get to do. I get to look at Jay and Tom, and I just say, go. And then we have a show. So we really have a good time with it. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You're with two big timers. I appreciate the time with you. And uh, go Penn State. Looking forward to a big, uh, big season for the Alliance.